Good morning, church family. Let's stand on up. The Lord is great. He is greatly to be praised, and it's an amazing thing that we get to enter into his presence. Let's sing to him this morning. of hell. 
big texts about being in God's presence, about what it's like in the throne room of God is Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each with six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. Your translation might say, I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You can pause there. That's a description. The Lord has given Isaiah this, this vision. If he were to actually physically, spiritually enter into God's presence without covering, he would do more than just say, woe is me. He would disintegrate. God's giving him this this grace gift of, of vision of what it is like to be in the throne room of God in your sin. We follow after this. The Lord provides for him a covering. The Lord provides for him a cleansing. We just sang it in this last song. By his grace and mercy, he has made us holy. Grace being unmerited favor. Giving to us riches that we don't deserve, that we have not earned. That's grace. Mercy is holding back and not giving us what we rightfully deserve. Judgment and wrath that our sins deserve. No, holding those back, instead giving us the righteousness of Christ, which makes us holy, perfect, set apart as Jesus is, ready to enter into the throne room of God. Friends, that is an amazing gift we've been given. And yet we live in this world. We sure don't look like we're ready to enter the throne room of God. There's such a gap between our daily experience and that future destiny that God has said is awaiting for us. And in the in-between, we trust him. We rely on him. We cooperate with his spirit so that that gap keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We'll never get there in this life. But by his grace, by his mercy, by his, his indwelling spirit, we want to commit ourselves, to consecrate ourselves, to give ourselves more and more over to him. Let's sing about that. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my Oh. 
Father, we need your help in making that true. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, this outside force that just transformed us when you showed us our sin, showed us our need for repentance. God, you are alone, our Lord of salvation. And yet, we are not in heaven yet. Our decisions matter. And God, your spirit, for those of us who are your children, you've made us alive and you've given us the clear and obvious choice to follow you. And as those who have been transformed, we gladly say, yes, I have decided with all my heart, open it wide and close it tight, shut on Jesus. I have decided to follow him. No turning back. And yet, Lord, we so often turn back in little ways here and there. They build up over time. Sometimes they explode on us. These ways in which we realize we've been following something else. God, we want to be single-minded people focused on you. Help us to make the words that we just sang true. Truer and truer each day. Have your way in the rest of our service this morning. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. In just a moment here, actually, right now, actually, <laughs> not just a moment, um, can I bring uh, Natalie and Ryan up to the front? We have something coming up on our, our calendar that we're excited about. Some of you already know why. Um, we are, this is the last Sunday before Natalie and Ryan give themselves to each other in marriage. And we are very excited as their church family, right front and center. Elders are going to come up and join you. You're not going to be by yourselves. <laughs> We're very excited uh, to celebrate that with them, to encourage them, to do everything that a, a church family ought to do to help them and, and support them. Um, but we're also going to acknowledge that as their lives come together and become one, it will likely lead them to a different place. And so in the, encompassing all of those things, I want to bring the elders forward, and we want to pray for her for him. Father God, you are Lord over everything. You are Lord over each of our individual lives. And God, Natalie and Ryan have chosen because of what you've done. They have decided to follow you. Each on their own, but then now together as a couple. God, I pray that you would bind them together as you are faithful to do in such a way that makes them realize that this is not just some human institution. This is not just some earthly promise that they've made. But that your stamp of approval is on it. And that you want to see them united for your glory in all things. And there are all kinds of things that this earth will throw at them at their marriage, attacks from outside, attacks even from inside. But we know that what you have supplied for them is enough, is sufficient to sustain, and if need be, to restore their marriage. So God, as they make their vows, as they make oaths before you, God, I pray that your spirit gives them everything that they need to rely on, to uphold those, to remain faithful to them, and to shine as, a, as, as lights in this world by the way that they sacrificially love one another. God, help them in this transition as all kinds of things change. Where they're going to live, how they're going to spend their time. God, give them wisdom. Allow them to not be paralyzed in fear, unable to make a decision until they hear some audible voice from you. Rather, understand that they have your seal of approval on them because they're your children, and they just need to step out in faith and follow you. God, be with their family. Be with their church family. They always know how to come along and support and when to give space. <laughs> all those things. God, we entrust all of this to you bless them. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me give them a hand. Yeah, we're excited about this. <laughs>
I want to invite our ushers down now as we get ready to receive our giving for this morning. Um, we have a passage from, from 1 Timothy 8. I encourage you to read that, but I'm, I'm going to encourage us in a different way. Something else that we sung earlier today. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Some of us sing those words and think, I might withhold some because I need to pay my bills. I need to feed my family. The Lord knows that. And the reason we know that we don't ask you to give every single bit of item of articles that you own every single Sunday is that next line. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. So even the silver and gold that you don't put in this offering, that you hold in your bank account, that's the Lord's too. The way that you use that is also an offering, is also a sacrifice of praise to him. And you understand that, and so you gladly give an understanding that he is the one who owns it all. As the is pass the offering, let's begin to sing. From heaven's throne you came to us and set your heart upon the cross. We'll never know the sacrifice you made. For all our sin and all our shame, you took the nails and took our place. No one else can do what you have done. One name is higher. One name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Christ exalted over all. From the grave where death would die, you rose again and brought us life. You're reigning now, the Savior of the world. You're Praise you 
We praise you this morning because you are uh, the head of your church. Even as we see that displayed in marriage, that you've given us that picture in marriage that just as Christ is the head of the church, so the husband is the head of his wife, you are the head of your church. You have made us your body. You have nourished and cherished us by the washing of water with the word. You have given yourself for us and for our salvation. And we praise you because you are the love of our lives. You are the sufficiency from which we draw every life and breath. And so it is because of that that we turn our hearts to your word. It's because of that that we lean into what you would have to say for us. And so do your work through my brother Alden in these next moments. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat. And uh, I'm holding this mic because I'm not speaking into that mic today. Um, so uh, kids can be dismissed right now, by the way. Uh, that is totally fine. One last thing I have to remember to do. Yeah, there you go. Um, so we've been studying the book of 2 Timothy. We are continuing to study the book of 2 Timothy today. Uh, but 2 Timothy uh, charges us, uh, charges Timothy in particular, uh, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also, and we said that in the immediate context, uh, Timothy would have been establishing elders. He would have been establishing others who could teach and preach God's word, uh, and then that would that would filter down to everyone. And we all have a responsibility in the end to uh, to be able to pass God's word on to others. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that we have done here at Oak Hill over the last four years is. Um, I, th I don't think this is the mic. I, I think that's something else. So, um, uh, well, One of the things that we've done over the last four years is uh, we've had a preaching cohort. And so this is our fourth time going through this and, and really equipping uh, more men than just me to be able to preach the word uh, so that we, we constantly have a deep bench uh, of qualified, faithful men uh, who can preach. And so we are so grateful that, that one of our elders is able to do that. We do that with our elders and with others who might have the gift of teaching. And, and, uh, and so uh, Alden Bowman is one of the most faithful men I know. Uh, he is uh, a, a steady companion in the work of the ministry. And, uh, and I am so glad to call him brother. I'm so glad to call him a fellow elder at this church. Um, and uh, last week we studied that a worker has who has no need to be ashamed, uh, is one who rightly handles the word of truth. And uh, I've watched Alden work really hard over the past two months or so uh, to make sure that he is rightly handling the word of truth. And uh, I'm really grateful that he uh, gets to share God's word with us today. And so uh, why don't you turn your attention, give your ear uh, to the preaching of God's word. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would be with us now as your weak servant tries his best to share your word with those that are in this room and with those that are watching online. Lord, may you convict our hearts in ways that you know our hearts need to be convicted. Lord, may this time be a time that we can see clearly our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may the words that come out of my mouth, Lord, glorify you and do your word justice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Some of you in the room probably don't know me, and that's okay. 
clearly the uh, communications assistant named Laura Cheek knows me well, because one of the first questions she asked me this morning is, Alden, do you need some Kleenexes up there this morning? <laughs> I said, no, Laura, I have a handkerchief in my pocket. I should be good. But don't be surprised if the, sphere, if the tears flow at some point this morning, because it wouldn't be a shock to me, and it definitely wouldn't be to my family. Uh, and with that, hi, Mom. She's watching from northern Vermont via the live stream that we have here at Oak Hill. Uh, no pressure with your mom watching you preach a sermon at all. <laughs> with that, let's get into God's Word this morning. I don't know about any of you, but have you ever stopped and thought about the number of hours you and your family spend cleaning your house, doing lawn work? Well, there was a research study done by the American Cleaning Institute, believe it or not, there is such a thing. Back in 2018, they conducted a survey and they found that on average, Americans spend nearly six hours per week cleaning their house. Laundry, toilet cleaning, mopping the floor, vacuuming, the list goes on and on. And oh, by the way, that doesn't include any time that you might spend outside mowing the lawn, weed whacking, mulching, Maybe some ice melt in the winter and shoveling a little bit of snow is included in there. So if you figure roughly six hours a week for the inside and another four hours a week on the outside, that's roughly ten hours a week we spend of our time cleaning our homes. I don't know about you. I'm tired already just thinking about it. But do the math with me. So 10 hours a week, there's 52 weeks in a year. That's 520 hours a year. So if you want to then assume that we have 60 years of useful life, because kids, we don't start making you mow the lawn until a certain age. We might get you behind a vacuum cleaner earlier than that. But anyhow, let's just say 60 years of useful life. If you do that math, that's 31,200 hours in our lifetime that we spend cleaning our homes, making the yard look nice. And at my house, I'm just mowing weeds because I can't grow a lawn, okay? Have you asked yourself why we do that? Why do we go through all that effort? Well, one of the first answers should be, if we're a follower of Jesus Christ, that we want to steward well what God has given us, right? We want to have our homes be useful not only for ourselves, but for those that we might invite over. Well, things wear out, and we have to maintain them, and it takes time, money, and lots of energy on each of our parts. In today's biblical text that we're going, by the way, there's going to be a lot of twos today. Second Timothy, second chapter, starting in verse 22. Anyhow, we'll be okay. We're going to see in today's text, how we are called to work at cleansing our spiritual selves to make us useful to the master of the house, that being God. Much like cleaning our homes and yards that requires many hours of work, we are called as servants of Christ to work hard to make ourselves holy for his use. Today's big idea is purify yourself as a useful servant of Jesus Christ. Purify yourself to be a useful, as a useful servant of Jesus Christ. Last week, Pastor Ben preached from 2 Timothy 2, 14 to 21, and today we will continue 22 to 26 in what is the fifth week in our sermon series called Faithful and Focused. I have the privilege of being the first to bump Pastor Ben out of the pulpit. <laughs> that wasn't planned, I don't think, but it's sort of fun. But more importantly, I'm here to share with you what I've learned from my study of God's Word. I believe Paul is showing great care and encouragement to his young disciple Timothy in the words we are about to read. In today's section of 2 Timothy 2, we will see how living our lives to and for Christ is critical to be a useful servant for Him. If we are to be a church who is faithful and focused to the ministry to which the Lord has called us, we need to apply what Paul is telling Timothy in this scripture to ourselves. Don't think that what Paul is saying is just for Timothy. 
my prayer for you and I today is that you, we would see how it applies to all of us as servants of Jesus Christ. If you don't have a Bible with you today, feel free to take one that's in the seat back pocket in front of you or maybe under the floor and underneath you. And if you don't have a Bible, we would love for you to take that home. It's important for us that you have God's Word with you. Put your finger in 2 Timothy in chapter 2 because we're going to be there here shortly. Last week, Ben's last point for his sermon was aligned with the word of truth completely, avoiding useless hypocrisy. And he got that from verses 20 and 21 in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. I would like to review these two verses as I believe is an important context for what we will be looking at today in 22 through 26. Read with me. 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21. It reads, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Before we move on to 22 to 26, I want to be sure to connect some dots with you. Verse 21 tells us that if we want to be useful to the master of the house, that is God, we must cleanse ourselves. The section we are studying today is going to tell us how and why we must cleanse ourselves to be useful to the Lord. How do we go about cleansing ourselves and why is it important? Obviously, most of us would say that we want to be useful. Like we want to make our homes useful. Many work tirelessly in their own strength to get better at a long list of improvements that we would like to see in our lives. According to the NDP Group, an American research company, the self-help industry has exploded in recent years. 11% from 2013 to 2019. The U.S. sales of self-help books growing annually up to 18.6 million copies a year. The industry is worth 10.5 billion, that is with a B, as of 2020. It's not that all self-help books are necessarily bad. Hear me in that. My point, however, is built into the title, self-help. If you are someone here today that hasn't had their heart taken over by Christ, I would suggest to you that Christ has a better plan for your life. And I believe this plan involves our reliance on Him, not on ourselves. If you have committed your life to Christ, I am willing to bet that at some point in the not-too-distant past, you have prayed a prayer asking for Him to use you. We want to be used by God, don't we? Read with me now, 2 Timothy 2, 22 to 26. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Having nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies, you know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. I see two overarching ways to be useful, a useful servant for God in today's biblical text. And the first one is to purge and pursue. The first part of verse 22 tells us to flee, to run away from, to escape from, to avoid at all costs. This can also include purging yourself if you are in sin, to make free of something unwanted, like a water line in a boiler that is plugged with gunk of some sort, and a plumber must purge the line to get the gunk out so that you can actually have a useful boiler. The way Paul is writing this verse is designed to communicate with Timothy and with all of us that action is required. This will require effort on our part. This is the first aspect of cleansing that Paul mentioned to Timothy and all believers. Youthful passions describe the sort of desires and temptations 
that are especially prominent with someone who is a young adult. And I believe it needs to be said that most, if not all, of what is described here as youthful passions occurs in those that are not so youthful, if you catch my meaning. We older, more seasoned folks should be paying attention as well. Things like impatience, intolerance, love of argument, self-assertion, impartiality. Sex, money, and power tend to be the three broad categories that sin falls into, and they have a very destructive effect in our lives if we don't purge them from our lives. The best biblical picture of fleeing I can find is when Joseph flees from Potiphar's wife in Genesis 39. Potiphar's wife is wrongly infatuated with Joseph and goes out of her way to have her way with him. Genesis 39, 11 to 12 reads, But one day when he, Joseph, that is, went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she, Potiphar's wife, caught him by the garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled, got out, of the house. He fled. He ran. He was out of there. This is a picture of the active present tense verb in this text that we're reading today. One of the definitions of purge is to free yourself from moral defilement. We shouldn't entertain these passions. Don't challenge them. Don't try and endure them. The idea of I will just test myself to see if I can handle this one. (laughs) Well, has led many to fall into sin. Identify what these passions are for you and run away from them. Run away from them. If we cannot flee or purge passions, there is a real limit to how much God can use us, a limit to how useful to the master of the house we can be. You can't really say yes to God until you say no to some other things. Purge that which is preventing you from being useful to God. Romans 6, 12 to 14 says it this way. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members of God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Keep these verses from Romans in mind as we work through the next part of verse 22. Cleansing can never be a matter of just avoiding bad things. It must also be the pursuit of good things. Therefore, there are both things that we must flee from or purge and things that we must pursue. Verse 22 continues to say, and and there's an and there, note that, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. The character traits that we are to pursue are by perfect design, Christ-like in nature. They are also in opposition to youthful passions that we are to flee from. Righteousness is literally the condition acceptable to God. Meaning, are you pursuing what is right? Do you have integrity in your interactions with others? Are you at peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you able to still love people? Are you able to still love people that you don't agree with? We are made in Christ Jesus to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Those things that we have, in fact, been saved to. You know, you can't see the words on the page when you have tears in your eyes. Sorry about that. We have an example of what it looks like to be pure and holy. And his name is Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus' example and call out to him in prayer. 
He is the perfect example of what it means to be a useful vessel for God. Depend on Him. As you seek to purge and pursue, if you are in Christ, you have been saved to be made useful for the kingdom of God. A disciple of Christ is growing in their dependence on in devotion to Jesus. I'm going to read that again. A disciple of Christ is growing in their dependence on in devotion to Jesus. Key verb there is growing, I-N-G. Not like you've arrived, but you're growing. How do believers of Jesus Christ grow in maturity toward Christ? By being dependent on Christ. To successfully purge and pursue, we must rely on the power of Christ in our lives. In Psalm 51, David prays that God might grant him a clean heart. David was plugging into the power of God to cleanse his heart. Think about David as an example of a man who prayed to God for a clean heart. Had David lived a perfect life? Far from it. That said, did God use David? Yep, he sure did. How is that possible? Well, in short, because of a work of God in David's life, God convicted David's heart. Understand this, you are saved by Christ, not by your works. David was most definitely not a perfect sin-free man, not even close. God isn't looking for your perfection. He is looking for your reliance on him. Reliance on him and not on self. May our prayer be that God gives us a clean heart. Check out the rest of verse 22. It is very nicely links how you might flee and pursue and be dependent on Christ. Along with It reads, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Sounds like to me we better get praying. And praying with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And what are we to pray for? That we would be made clean so that we could be useful vessels for the master of the house. Just like we needed Christ to be made righteous before God, we need him to purify us for the work he has given us to do. Reliance on Christ and not on self is vital to fleeing and pursuing. Our prayer needs to be, make me clean for your use, Lord. Make me clean. And then get specific with what you need help with. Share your struggles with a brother or sister in Christ and pray together. This is a perfect example of what we call accountability partners here at Oak Hill Fellowship Church, where you're pairing up with other people and you're talking to each other about the struggles that you're having in your life. Well, share your struggles in your accountability partner with your accountability and cry out to God. What are you pursuing that you should be purging or fleeing from? What are you pursuing that you ought to be purging or fleeing from? God hears your prayers and can convict your heart and cause the needed change to happen. We need those of pure heart speaking Christ into our lives. This is a good example of what we have been reading about in our gospel communities from the Transforming Mutual Care book. The introduction to this book is titled A Manner of Life Worthy of the Gospel of Christ. It cites Philippians 1.27, which ends with striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Striving side by side, so together with each other, believers in Jesus Christ, for the faith of the gospel. We need each other. And we need each other to point to Christ. This leads us to verse 23, which reads, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. There seems to be a consistent theme in the second chapter of 2 Timothy. Verse 2.14 contains not to quarrel about words. Verse 2.16 contains avoid irreverent babble. In, In verse 23 that I just read, we see have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies because they breed quarrels. 
So Paul clearly has something for us to understand in chapter 2 about getting involved in quarrels and controversies. It's important for us to remember that Paul is giving Timothy and all of us instructions on how to handle these types of situations amongst those that are in the church. Remember that the them that is back in verse 2.14 are those in the church in Ephesus, the church that Timothy was a pastor for. <clears throat> you know, it's easy to think of how we might respond to a social media post that seems faceless and appears to simply be full of everyone's opinion and probably little or no facts to be shared. It is different to consider that we are to avoid these things amongst people that we go to church with and see every week. Hang with me on this topic as there are instructions as how to do this in verses 24 and 25 to come. There is an additional reason that Paul has this repeated instruction of not engaging in irreverent babble and foolish, ignorant controversies. And that is that in doing so, we get distracted. We take our eye off the ball. And I think it happens more easily than we care to admit. Instead of focusing on our ministry areas that we have been called to, we are expending energy and time with those in the church that are causing foolish, ignorant controversies. Although I get how this is easier said than done and how much discernment is required, I also understand that it is in this section of 2 Timothy for a reason. Take time to consider if you're using time and energy in situations like these and then pray for discernment. I don't know about you, but I need help to be a useful vessel for his kingdom. This will help us pursue the ministry areas we are called to. The first way to become a useful servant for God was to purge and pursue. The second is proclaim Jesus and be patient. Proclaim Jesus and be patient. Read with me now 2 Timothy 24, 2, that is, 24 to 26. It reads, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. These three verses seem to bridge the gap between not participating in foolish, ignorant controversies on the one hand and the tensions that that can bring with how we are to act as we represent Christ as his servant toward those that could be categorized as opponents. When Paul wrote to Timothy about a servant of the Lord, as seen in the beginning of verse 24, he told him about some of the basic characteristics of a godly man. A servant of the Lord is defined here as someone who gives himself up for Christ's will and whose service is used by Christ in extending and advancing his cause among men. The key being that it is Christ's will, not our own will. We do not act on behalf of our calling in Christ. We are to represent him to others. Our action should be Christ-like in nature. And those actions may speak louder than our words. Our actions are to be Christ-like in nature. And those actions may speak louder than our words. As a servant of the Lord, must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. The great men and women of our world are not usually thought of as servants nor as gentle. Yet in the kingdom of God, greatness is marked by being a servant of the Lord and by being gentle to all. John Kelvin said this this way, Paul's meaning is that gentleness should be shown even to those who least deserve it. And even if at first there is no apparent hope of progress, still... The challenge must be accepted. We must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. It is not our job as a believer to pick fights and to look for conflict. 
Some people, and even those among us, only feel energized and motivated if they have an argument. Timothy and every believer should, not be, should be of a different sort. Timothy must be able also to teach, as shown in verse 24. With the huge emphasis Paul placed on God's Word, a ministry leader must, lead, must be able to teach. I think it could be easy for many of us to take a pass on this one, as they don't see themselves as a teacher. However, if you're a parent, trust me, you're a teacher. If you're a brother and sister and have siblings, you're a teacher. If you're grandparents and you're spending time with your kids and your grandkids, oh brother, are you a teacher? It doesn't have to be in a large group setting. Don't let this requirement pass you by, because as a believer in Christ, you are called to pass on the wisdom found in Scripture. Every believer should be able to pass the treasure of the gospel in the way of the disciple on to others that they encounter. Next, verse 24 highlights that we must be patient. God's work often takes time. Sometimes we can see why it takes so much time, and sometimes we can't. But God is not in a hurry and wants us to learn how to patiently trust Him. I must admit, this is probably the toughest issue for me personally. I have a high D personality style, which kind of means be brief and be gone. <laughs> God has shown me patience and mercy over the years as a believer in him. Patience and mercy when I didn't deserve it. But isn't that just like our Lord and Savior? He teaches us patience by putting us in situations that we can't control and need him to work in. If you struggle with patience like I do, my hope and prayer for you is that God teaches you patience. Remember patience with your spouses and your children and your co-workers and the people around you here at Oak Hill Fellowship. Remember the grace we are granted by God through his son, Jesus Christ. And have patience with each other. Timothy and all believers are to be not only patient, but gentle in correcting those who are in opposition. Let me say that again. We are to be gentle as we are correcting those who are in opposition. Yes, you heard me right. You heard me correctly. We are to correct. We aren't to just sit around and let people misconstrue God's word. We must lift high the truth. But we are to do so gently. It's not that Timothy or any believer isn't to confront those who need to be confronted, but we must do so with gentleness, with love and care for the people we are talking to. We need to check our hearts for the motivation we have by engaging in these types of discussions. Are our hearts filled, are our hearts filled with love for the person we are correcting? Quote-unquote, correcting? Or are we just wanting to be seen as right so that we can make our point and move on. This leads us to the second half of verse 25, which reads, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Wowza. <laughs> Here is the why part of today's scripture. All the cleansing and purification that we are called to as believers in Jesus Christ is so that we may represent him to others in such a way that God might grant repentance. Talk about good news. They need to repent, and this will never happen apart from a work of God in their heart. The idea is not maybe God will or maybe God won't grant them repentance. The idea is more it's a remarkable thing to see this work of God, and I won't presume upon it happening. This reminds me of the patience I need. 
so that I'm not presuming on God's work in another person's life. It could be easy for any of us to not correct, or at least not correct with gentleness, kindness, and patience. To ignore our calling to correct is to either assume God won't use the correcting to call someone to repentance and to be able to see the truth, or that God has no need for us to partake in the activity of correcting. I believe we are missing the point on either of these lines of thinking. The point of everything we have read so far in 2 Timothy 2, 22-25, is how to become a useful vessel for God. In short, as I have said already, we need to purge and pursue so that we can be an honorable vessel that God will use. We need to own our part and leave God's part to God. We are called to make disciples. Whether the person we are engaged with is granted repentance by God or not doesn't change our responsibility as a servant of Christ. I will also say loud and clear that if God does grant repentance, there ought to be some celebrating going on. We should celebrate what he has done. Remember, the goal is to win a brother or sister, not an argument. This leads us to verse 226, which reads, And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Anyone who fights against God is deceived and must come to their senses. Repentance flows as someone comes to the truth in this way. Those who are in opposition to God's work, whether they know it or not, are bound in deception. The need to escape the snare of the devil and God can set them free. Paul spoke of those who serve the devil and those who serve God, useful vessels versus non-useful vessels, as we saw back in verses 20 and 21. There is a choice for every person, every Christian, who they will decide to serve, to be a servant of the Lord, a vessel of honor for him. We must be empty, clean, and available. If we refuse to empty ourselves, clean ourselves, and make ourselves available to the Lord, we will find ourselves captive to the devil in one sense or another. I'd like for you to consider how many times you had to hear the gospel before God used it to convict your heart and cause you to see the truth. How many times did you have to hear the gospel from someone for God to use that so that you could see the truth? And if you are like me, you still need to hear the gospel as God continues to convict your heart and to show you the truth. The gift of repentance is like no other gift that you can be granted. Although God calls his useful servants to share the good news repeatedly, we must be patient while doing our part. We must represent him well in Christ-like love, patience, mercy, and care. This is what 1 Peter 2, 22-24 says about Christ. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. There it is, folks that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Purge the sin and pursue the righteousness of God. Preach the gospel and be patient. We are about to sing a song entitled, You've Already Won. I guess when you preach, you get to choose at least one song. When you sing it with me, 
See if you can see how Christ is calling us to live out what we have been saved to in Him. Join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is right that we would be weak vessels. That you would use Because we must, when we're weak, rely on you. Help us to not have man-made ideas as to how we can make somebody Christ-like. Lord, we ask that you would make us clean and that then you would use us to boldly share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those that we encounter. And Lord, would you fill us with patience and mercy and peace and love so that we could represent you well. Help us to not think you need perfection in us. Because what you need, Lord, is for us to have a reliance on your ability. May you fill us with that compassion and conviction in our hearts so that we can go forward and share the good news that is better news than any news we could receive today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. I'm fighting a battle You've already won. So no matter what comes my way, I will overcome. Don't know what you're doing, but I know what you.
confidence in the future. Sing that. I know how the story ends. We will be with you again. You're my Savior, my defense. No more fear in life or death. Oh, I Amen. Oh, Lord, we pray and we thank you that no matter what we face in this life, you know the battle and you know the end. And yours is the victory. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Yours is the honor forever and ever. Amen. And you have fought that battle, and you have won that battle so that you will receive all that you are due. And so, Lord, as we fight against sin, we trust that you have conquered sin. As we pursue righteousness, we trust that Jesus has given us his righteousness. As we proclaim Jesus, we trust that your spirit goes before us. And as we wait to see it work, as we wait to see the gospel do its work, we trust in your perfect timing and your ability to grant repentance. And so help us, Lord, help us to trust you as we serve you. Help us to see ourselves as servants of you and not of any other person or of ourselves ultimately. But that we are your servant, vessels in your hands, that we might be useful to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can I have a seat? Do you have just a few announcements? Uh, some ways that, that we are seeking to be faithful and focused as a church. And so, first of all, uh, if you are a guest with us here today, we are so glad that you are here. And uh, we would love to invite you back to the Connections table, which is right back. If you're going that way, it's on your right. And uh, you can fill out uh, a Connect card and let us know if, uh, if you would like more information about Oak Hill or if you would like to come to one of our Consider Oak Hill gatherings, which is a, a lunch where you get to talk to our leaders a little bit, get to know us, get to know what our church is all about. Uh, just a hint, what we're all about is what uh, Alden was preaching about today, that, that we would uh, throw off the things of the flesh, that we would pursue Christ, that we would proclaim him, and that we would wait patiently to see him work. And, and we're going to trust him 
uh, all along the way. And so if you want to know more about what that looks like in this particular context, uh, meet us back there at the connections table. We'll get you, we'll get you hooked up. Uh, we also have a gift for you back there if you do fill out a card. Um, next Sunday, uh, Doug Pritchard is going to be preaching uh, another one of our elders, newest elder, gets to preach next week, and uh, he's going to be preaching from uh, the third chapter of Second Timothy, uh, the very beginning, and he's got a tough text, so pray for him this week, uh, but it's a, it's a good one and, and uh, one that is really, really necessary for us to understand as we, uh, as we consider what church is like in a fallen world, and, uh, and so... Uh, we encourage you to pick up a reading plan if you if you don't already have that. Doug's going to be studying this week. You can study this week too. And uh, and there's some reading plans back there at the connections table as well. Um, hey, guess what? We got some baptisms coming up. Lord willing, looking forward to that. Uh, September third, uh, we're going to be we're going to do it right here in this building, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna fill up a tank of water, and we're gonna put some people under. Uh, but but we're we're going to be. Uh, talking about our next steps in Christ all throughout the fall, and there are some people who are ready to take their next step in baptism. And so uh, if you are not one of those who have already talked to us, um, I would encourage you to talk to us about taking your next step in baptism. If you've never, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've put your trust in him, but you've never been baptized as a believer, uh, we would invite you to do that here at Oak Hill on September 3rd. And we, we have a little bit of a, you know, we have a conversation with you, study some scriptures together, make sure that we know what we're talking about when we're talking about baptism, and then we, we, uh, we, we baptize you. So um, it's an important first step. Uh, we are also, just the week before that, we have an end of summer praise and prayer service coming up. And uh, this, is, this is a way that we can, at the end of a summer, talking about uh, ministry, right? Talking about ministering God's word to one another and praying for one another. This is a way that we can put this into practice, where, where you can give testimony to what the Lord has been teaching you and how he's been uh, instructing you and shaping you throughout the summer, and, and, and where you can then pray for others as well. And, and so uh, this is something that we love to do at the end of the summer. It's going to be a muddy run park, this, both the service and the the lunch, and, and so uh, we're looking forward to that, but you need to sign up. Uh, we need to know how many are coming. I know that's not our favorite thing to do. I believe there is a, a, a QR code back at the coffee station. You could you could uh, scan that QR code today even and sign up today and be like a whole month and a half ahead. It'd be amazing. Um, so uh, please do that. And, and then uh, just a couple other quick announcements. Uh, our gospel communities are meeting this week, uh, so if you... Yeah, 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 I'm excited too. Um, and so uh, if you are, are not familiar with our gospel communities, it is uh, the way that you can feel most connected here at Oak Hill. We, we talk about uh, the sermon. Uh, we talk about what it looks like to minister to one another. Uh, and we pray for one another in our walk with the Lord. And, and so uh, we'd, I would encourage you to go to oakhillfellowship.com backslash gospel communities. Click on one of the leaders' uh, names, and you can email them, let them know you're coming, ask them any questions that you might need to know. Uh, and then finally, this Wednesday, every Wednesday throughout the summer, uh, we're having ladies' prayer walks, and so they are gathering at Huffnagel Park. Uh, they are walking around the circle uh, there at Huffnagel Park, just praising God for his attributes, crying out for him to work. And so ladies, uh, I would encourage you to make that a priority this summer. And uh, with that, I want you to know you are loved. Have a great day in the Lord.